items coming up, so I'll get moving. Welcome, everybody. My goal today is to talk about not just food allergies, but also other things that fall into the category of adverse reactions to foods. You might know some already. Please feel free to ask questions at any point. Um, I hope <clears throat> it is my way to want to just dot it with a little bit of the science of how the definitions are formed. So, but I don't want to bore anybody. It's, it's, um, we have enough excitement right, and drama right now with thunder right, and lightning. Okay, so it's kind of a which foods to include and which to replace. And the first thing I want to do <coughs> is give you the definition of these reaction. So an allergy means that it involves your immune system and people can have allergies to a number of things. So I'm talking mainly food. Um, and there's a category called oral allergy syndrome or pollen food syndrome, but I'll spend a bit of time on. And then <clears throat> there's the category of intolerance. And an intolerance to a food doesn't involve your immune system. It just means that for some reason you may have some enzymes that normally break food down that aren't as active, or there might be something else about the food that binds to the linings of your intestines or binds to the linings of other parts of your body and affect you. <coughs> but it isn't specifically an allergy. So we're defining allergy <clears throat> as an abnormal reaction to substance which, substances which are ordinarily harmless. In this case, it could be you know something in an apple, something in um, a piece of chicken, something in a, in a piece of shrimp. And it normally, <clears throat> you develop it on the second or a subsequent occasion. So you, you, normally an allergic reaction doesn't happen the first time. And the true allergy, as I mentioned just a moment ago, should be left to a condition in which the individual formally unreactive reacts with an appearance of antibodies. <coughs> so I'm going to define antibodies just, you know, in a, in a friendly way, what I like to call my, my Sesame Street version of antibodies. Once you have an antibody, we've heard a lot of this speaking about getting boosters and getting um, that's something to protect us from either not catching COVID or having very minor symptoms. <clears throat> you want to your body learns to recognize something and then it forms an antibody to that thing. In the case of food, it shouldn't. There's nothing about the food stuff that's the problem, but the body reacts. So the eight most common foods that cause allergic reactions that involve the immune system are peanuts, tree nuts, milk, egg, wheat, soy, <clears throat> varieties of fish, and shellfish. <clears throat> so when we talk about allergic activity, it means that these are foods which are commonly going to tell the immune system, I'm here, I'm tiny, I'm microscopic, but I think you should be ready to attack me because it seems like I want to attack you. And those include the fish, notably codfish, but also other fish as, as letter C. <clears throat> and they're found all over, fresh water, salt water. Um, and oddly, most people who are fish allergic can tolerate tuna. <coughs> but, um, we are also awfully allergic in general to shrimp and crawfish or the crustaceans and the mollusks. So I took a moment to talk about what is the difference between a crustacean and a mollusk. I like to think that <clears throat> we would save mollusk shells when we find them on the beach. Those are the ones we put in our pockets and take home and put them on the shelf because they're pretty. We don't save the shells of crustaceans. They're kind of gross. Um, out either way, these are foods which for some people, there will be a reaction to some protein or some category of protein in the food. 
So the list that the, I started with was fish, notably codfish, crustaceans, mollusks, and other fish. Another set of foods with significant allergic activity includes cow's milk. And the case of cow's milk, it's, it's not the sugar in the milk, that's actually the lactose is an intolerance, but it's one of the proteins in the milk, notably casein and what's called a beta lactoglobulin. That will not show up on any crossword puzzle that I can imagine you'll ever want to do, but it's out here. And then in case of eggs, you can be allergic to something in the egg white, which you'll see there are three different kinds of protein in the egg white, as well as something in the egg yolk. And heat stable is important. Remember what's happening is that this protein microscopic that it is, gets into the body, the immune system recognizes it as something harmful, which it really isn't, and then develops an antibody to it. And that antibody then circulates through the blood and can create a lot of symptoms. I'll talk about those symptoms in a second. But if it is a protein, many times a protein can be destroyed or denatured in this presence of heat. But if you are allergic to something in the egg yolk, the heating of the egg will not destroy or inactivate that allergy producing protein. Most of the time it will. Then another category of foods which have a lot of allergic activity are peanuts. And what is in the peanut could be this thing called alpha arachin and another kind of uh, called a con arachin. And this might actually be in cold pressed peanut oil. As a, everyone can say, no peanut butter, no fresh peanuts, you know, handful here for a snack or in a mixed nut um, combination. But it's possible even if you're peanut allergic that cold pressed peanut oil could contain one of the proteins that causes the antibody formation. And soybeans, several of these proteins called globulins, and peas, which also have a kind of protein called an albumin. Another, going along here with what the eight at most allergenic food categories are, also includes oil seeds. So cotton seed isn't something that we'll eat very often. It is a product of the food industry and it's blended into some of the, the, the commercial less expensive margarines. Sometimes it's an oil blended with other oils in, in chips and um, snacks, which is why a lot of chip bags make a big deal about showing made with 100% canola oil or 100% something without the cotton seed. And sesame seeds. I have a close friend who is sesame seed allergic. Flax seed, which um, is illustrated, um, is photographed rather in the bottom. And probably, as trivia goes, you might know if you get flax seeds that haven't somehow been um, damaged through something like ultraviolet light or something, you sprinkle those in the soil and they grow the plant linen. And linen is the plant that the fiber is um, taken from that we use to make linen fabric. And when the linen is ready to be harvested in order to take the fibers to make fabric, it's all uh, very blonde. So you'll hear the phrase of someone having flaxen hair because it's talking about the, the pale color of the plant linen that grows from the flax seed. And some of the things that as a dietitian I eagerly promote, eating more tomatoes because they're so anti-inflammatory, celery and carrots, these could also contain a protein. And we don't think of tomato or celery or carrot as being protein foods, not like chicken or, or egg, but they will still contain potentially alert allergenic or allergy generating proteins. Wheat and corn. And finally in the bottom, kiwi, melons, apples, strawberries, oranges, even the skins of fruit may have some uh, product, some protein that different people can be allergic to. So I have this thing I mentioned earlier, it's an antigen. And that means that it's something in a fruit, in a food or in the, in the world, in the environment, a virus, a bacteria, a parasite, or in the case of food allergy, 
a very small protein, which the body thinks is foreign. And as this foreign protein, it becomes a target where the immune system will hop on it like crazy and create something called um, an antibody to capture that protein. The antibody can then park in some tissue of the body. And that's where some of the symptoms that we get from an allergic reaction come from. Now, I'm not going to talk about this slide, but I want you to see that when we talk about the cells of the immune system, when the, the thing that the body's reacting to, the antigen is met by the immune system, all these different cells to uh, get generated to protect us from either something truly dangerous like a parasite or a bacteria or a virus or something which is not potentially dangerous like a protein from a food. And the systems of the body infected include the respiratory system. Um, I tried to get cool pictures as the best I could do here. <clears throat> so people might find they, get, they will wheeze, they will um, have trouble breathing. The digestive system when there are once again, that um, invading protein is captured by an antibody and the antibody plugs into tissues inside the body. And that's when the tissues might then get, for the short while anyway, inflamed. Um, the idea is that the body, <clears throat> the antibody loses, wins the battle, but loses the war. Okay, the skin. <clears throat> Many people know about getting skin rashes, lots of itchiness and redness. Um, vascular system, so this would be the blood vessels. They can also get um, open up more after an antibody um, has formed and released substances into the system. And the central nervous system. So you think, well, what's the deal with the central nervous system? Well, headaches. Um, it could be even something like moodiness or something like um, anxiety or restlessness could be signs of a reaction to the immune system reacting to a food allergen. One of the ones that's most famous <clears throat> that can be generated by pollen or generated by lots of things is histamine. So what, here's the deal. This foreign protein comes in the body, the body creates an antibody to capture it. The antibody attaches to some cell in the body, in this case, something called a mast cell, and the mast cell shoots out histamine. And the histamine ha can um, open up capillaries. <clears throat> and if that happens in the, in the, around the face, you get puffiness because those capillaries are now sort of leaky and fluid can accumulate and you, you swell up, your eyes can swell, could be a histamine reaction. Um, can also open blood vessels. And if they get particularly leaky, then your blood pressure can drop. That's kind of dangerous. Smooth muscles can contract very sharply and a smooth muscle are the ones we call involuntary. So that's the muscles of the lungs, the muscles of the heart, the muscles of the intestines. <coughs> And you can imagine if those muscles start contracting very sharply, that can result in diarrhea. Okay, or an asthma-like reaction. Okay, so that's what histamine does. And we've all gone to the uh, scene in, this, in the pharmacy, antihistamines. So these are products that we can take that will relieve the body from some of the powerful effect of histamines that are normally produced when the body recognizes, maybe by mistake, but it thinks it sees a dangerous protein. <clears throat> so it misguidedly makes this immune, system, immune tissue, uh, in, immunoglobulin E, <clears throat> to make the host unpleasant to the invading protein, but in the end we do recover and feel better. So swelling of lips and tongue, the problem of loss of blood pressure depending on the other. So most food allergies <clears throat> are more annoying, but you, we've all met people who have to carry an EpiPen. 
um, so that they can reverse the effect of that allergic response. I'm just mentioning these. I promise you I won't go into them in huge detail, but I just think they're important to be a part of the total story. So there are different types of immune system reactions. Type one, which is the one most often from food, <clears throat> where you have this, um, what we just described, the rash, the swelling of your, of your face, the effect on your heart, effect on your intestines. <clears throat> it's immediate and generalized means it can affect all those different systems in the body. Those different systems. Okay, next one. Type two, this one is often not a food reaction. Type three is not a food reaction, but you see these can occur hours, days, or weeks later, which makes understanding the cause of the allergic reaction possibly very um, challenging, but that's why allergists exist. Yeah, okay. Type four is also a food type. Um, it happens in the cell, it's somewhat delayed, and it's a similar reaction to when people are taking medications in order to not reject a transplanted organ. Once again, it's the body saying, I don't know what that protein is. It looks foreign. It could be dangerous. Let's go after it. And then type four, type five, rather. I'll learn to read my Roman numerals one of these days. Okay. So curiously, there are some food, some what we call clinical disorders, medical conditions that possibly could be resulting from or made worse by food allergies. People who have an autoimmune condition, which includes type one diabetes, it includes lupus, it includes rheumatoid arthritis, may be at more risk throughout their lifetime of developing an allergic reaction to something in a food, a protein in a food. It doesn't mean that um, it means that, it means it needs to if if you're it's affecting the quality of your life you let an allergist kind of open it up with you. So for example, a small number of people with rheumatoid arthritis also have sensitivities to food, notably to tartrazine, which is a yellow food color. Now the nutrition facts and the nutrition information on food labels, by law, will indicate the presence of any alert allergens in the food. So you'll pick up a lot of packages and it says may contain milk or egg or if it has the tartrazine food color because it is a well-established um, adverse reaction. And people with rheumatoid arthritis may also be bothered by milk and also by tobacco, although I know a lot of people who smoke. <laughs> people with lupus may have sensitivities to sodium nitrite. And you'll find a lot of sodium nitrite in foods like hot dogs and ham and bacon and cold cuts that are kept pink. They may also have a sensitivity to black walnut and also to alfalfa seeds. Um, so here's a, a showing of alfalfa sprouts, which we can easily find in many markets. Um, one of the things about alfalfa sprouts that I think is more um, a bigger caution is that they should be very well rinsed before eating because they are a potential source of microbial growth because they are allowed to soak in water while they sprout. So don't stop eating them unless you can um, sort of compare your an adverse effect from eating them. And notably, this is with people who, with lupus. I'm gonna move on. So I actually paused for a moment and thought, black walnut versus English walnut. I know they're, when um, doing nutrition education, the English walnut is the one that gets all the play. The English walnut is promoted. And that's mostly, not only just for flavor, but also it's commercially more popular. It's the side, I, I took this information from another source that it's more appealing in taste. It's used in cooking and baking, whereas the black walnut has a stronger, what is called an earthier flavor. And it's that, you know, supply and demand. If people prefer English walnuts, they're grown in much greater um, volume than the black walnuts. 
But a flip side to that is that black walnut is very popular for wood. If you, one is going to have custom made products or even look for the kind of wood in furniture that they prefer, the black walnut is gorgeous. Um, so if one wants to try black walnuts with their stronger flavor, and also noting at the bottom, they have slightly more fat and more protein, there, it is possible to order them online. They're not, they can be shipped directly to the consumer, but otherwise, all the walnuts that we're seeing in the market, you know, your, your everyday walnut is the English walnut variety. So if a person with lupus is trying to rule out or um, minimize or eliminate foods that might be exacerbating their symptoms of inflammation or um, muscle pain and fatigue, they might want to be aware of alfalfa sprouts and alfalfa seeds, but also of black walnut and sodium nitrate. Okay, um, some other <clears throat> medical conditions that might be a, a consequence of a food allergy, including inflammatory bowel syndrome, schizophrenia. So these are big deals, by the way, and I'm not medically going to um, qualify how food may or may not be have a role, but it has been proposed so that anyone with inflammatory bowel syndrome <clears throat> is strongly encouraged to try a food elimination for a period of time to see if their symptoms improve. Migraine headaches similarly could be triggered by some of the proteins and the immune system affected, affected in foods. And possibly learning disabilities. Now these, again, <clears throat> the takeaway isn't that if any of us has a loved one with migraines or learning disabilities, that we immediately strip their pantry or their cabinets of all food and start with something very basic. That's not what we mean. It's something that should be medically evaluated, but I think it's very interesting that there is medical support that there could be a role <clears throat> I would emphasize even here that only 5% of people with rheumatoid arthritis are sensitive to tartrazine and milk and tobacco. So, but we all know anything you have, if you can make it, um, minimize it more, that's so important. So <clears throat> another possibility exists that in any condition related to abnormal digestion. So, um, what is abnormal digestion? So a person who overeats, that's a, again, a, a tricky one. It says there's a point in where the, you, what you ate for your meal should have been okay, but you feel like you need more and you want to eat again in an hour as opposed to maybe two and a half to three and a half hours later. If you constantly feel the need to take antacids and achlorhydria, I know there's a big word for you. That is when there is less normal hydrochloric acid being made in the stomach. Um, these increase the chance that the lining of your intestines is kind of loosey-goosey and things that should not have left the intestines and gone into the bloodstream, instead that's happening. It's called a leaky gut. And when things leave the intestines and get into the bloodstream, the immune system says, who are you and what are you doing here? and can start an immune reaction, which can, again, affect um, central nervous system. So moodiness, headaches can affect digestion, can affect quite a few things. So we want to be not afraid of food, but at least recognize that foods are, at times, um, contributing to some symptoms. OK, <clears throat> what else is out there that's trying to get us? <laughs> Don't turn your back on wheat. <laughs> I'm, I'm one who has evolved from people who say, I can't eat wheat, it, it makes me sick, that I would have said at some point in time, they're probably not really wheat sensitive, they just, you know, haven't got any imagination. But there's a lot more science now that wheat can bother people in ways that are part of the immune system, of, aside from the wheat allergy called celiac disease. <clears throat> and so, once again, to omit wheat 
from your usual food choices for a period of seven or so days. And if you feel better, then it was worth it and you should do your best to continue. Rice is normally considered a very, very low allergenic food, but it, you know, it falls very low on the list, but it's still there, as well as corn. I have a friend, a different friend, one with sesame seed allergy, another friend with a corn allergy. <clears throat> Oil seeds, oops, we mentioned those briefly, and the tomatoes. By the way, what, what most vegetables, the the cooked vegetable is less problematic than the raw vegetable. And that might be true for many other foods, as I mentioned it earlier about egg, although some things that fall allergies really are heat, not broken down by heat or not denatured by heat. Okay, here we are at the next thing, which is if you have an allergy to a pollen, you could actually be experiencing an allergy or adverse symptoms to other foods. I think I might have mentioned this very briefly in a previous chat, so let me give it a little more um, substance today. <clears throat> when you have an allergic reaction, if you recall, we mentioned type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4, type 5, then there are these different immune bodies that are all created, and I showed you a slide, and it's very complex, but the way it works is that one makes three of the other, and those three make three more of something else, and you have what is called this cascade. So if during the summer, when grasses <clears throat> are going into seed, and then there's pollen in the air, while that particular grass is in the air, if you eat cantaloupe or honeydew or watermelon or the fruits that are in that um, botanical family, you might experience something. Something could be rash, could be um, headache, could be just sort of digestive distress, something unpleasant. And if you eat the same food three months later when this grass pollen is all gone, you will eat the same food and nothing happens. So it kind of gets it a little tricky to narrow it down. <clears throat> Similarly, during the time when you're having an allergic reaction, if you are allergic to orchard grass, when you eat peanuts, you might get an adverse effect. And even these foods, the white potato and tomato might bother you during the time that pollen is in the air. Another pollen from another grass is called Timothy grass. Um, now, if I went out right now to, um, let's say, the, the less manicured parts of Wave Hill or any other parks where there's, you know, a proper amount of weeds, we could find these grasses. They look so innocent, uh, but it's a matter of if you are allergic to the pollen, you may cross react to Swiss chard or orange. <clears throat> Now in the spring is the birch tree, which is all over, it's pretty profuse in New York City, lots of wonderful trees are. Um, and this pollen, if you are allergic to it, may sensitize you to quite a few fruits and vegetables and other seeds. <clears throat> so the goal is not that you can treat the pollen allergy but just hold off on eating those foods during the season when you're allergic to the birch. Ragweed is something which will come up in the fall. Um, so you'll see ragweed and goldenrod and mugwort. I'm sure Barbara knows them well because we're constantly yanking them up out of our gardens. They are <clears throat> very opportunistic. I mean, they never suffered in the drought that we had up until this morning. They were still big and strong and saying, yeah, what, what you're going to tell me. But in the outside chance, you are allergic to ragweed pollen or mugwort pollen. <clears throat> These are foods that might bother you during that time. Um, so I'm going to roll back and say, these are the pollens that might cause you to react to fruits and vegetables and some nuts while that pollen is in season. But let's suppose you might have a documented allergy to cow's milk. You might also be allergic to goat's milk, 
mare's milk and sheep's milk. I'll have, let me just spell that properly. Um, now, I don't know where I would find mare's milk, really. <laughs> I'm sure it's online somewhere. Um, but I know many people allergic to goat's milk, uh, cow's milk, try goat's milk, and they're comfortable with it. So it's the possibility. If you're allergic to hen's egg, you might also be allergic to goose egg, turkey, duck. You might even be sensitive to chicken meat, and you might even be sensitive to birds' feathers. This, I'm wondering, does anybody have experience with um, like a down blanket or <clears throat> a down jacket bothering them if they know that they have an, an egg allergy? So we mentioned codfish in one of the earlier slides. You might also be sensitive to mackerel, herring, and other fishes. And by the way, tuna, I think this is in an earlier slide, is often well tolerated even by people who have fish allergy. <clears throat> Could also, if you have a peanut allergy, because even though we call it a peanut, peanut is actually a bean, it's a legume. So you might cross react with soybean, green beans, or lima beans. And shrimp, similarly. Remember the deal with the mollusks and a crustacean? Mollusk shell you might take home as a souvenir, but a crustacean shell with a shrimp, uh -uh, can't be bothered. Okay, <clears throat> less well documented would be if hazelnut allergies are associated with other nuts. With wheat allergy and other grass pollen, because wheat is really a fancy form of grass, very fancy. Kiwi and birch or birch reacting foods. I'm going to scroll back up here. This was the birch seed. And kiwi is not in the picture because the evidence is weaker. <clears throat> Apple, same for that, and banana. So banana seems to be one of the ones that finds its way into anything having to do with latex. Um, is, I'm wondering if anyone here ever goes to pick milkweed and the, it gets its name, it has a fancy Latin name, but it gets its common name because if you break a stem, a white latex comes out. And the same way people are allergic to latex gloves or <clears throat> other latex products, they might at the same time have an adverse reaction to eating banana and avocado and pear and possibly fig. And if you do have a latex allergy, <clears throat> and you know this because it has been documented, this is not the tree to keep in your house as an ornamental um, green uh, greenery. Because if you shake a fig tree, it sheds little white dust, almost like dandruff. Not very flattering, right? But when you shake that fig tree, you will see white dust kind of start to shoot out and fall to the ground. That's a latex. And if you, it could super sensitize you to other things which are latex, um, have latex in them. There's lots of other indoor plants you can love. Um, but the, and the ficus tree is beautiful, but if you're allergic, it's not your friend. Okay, so. <clears throat> The list that I just shared with you, this is sort of refining it a bit, bit more. I did say if you're peanut allergic, because it's actually a legume, what's the chance that you could have sensitivity to other legumes? And according to the statistics, it's, it's possible, but it's very low, 5%. And if you're bothered by walnut, how likely are you to be bothered by Brazil nuts and cashews and hazelnuts? Well, you could be one of, let's say, a third of people with a tree with a walnut allergy to be allergic to other things. And fish, it's likely that you are allergic to other fish, such as if you're allergic to salmon, to swordfish or sole, shellfish, crab and lobster. Um, <clears throat> and there's a little um, kinky story that goes in here that if you are allergic to lobster or shrimp, and 75% of people who are allergic to one will likely be allergic to the other, you might also be allergic to the droppings of roaches because they are also um, crustaceans. Yes. <laughs> and you don't want to save those shells for a summer memory either. <laughs> okay. 
So if you're bothered by wheat, a small percentage of people bothered by wheat will also be bothered by barley and rye. And oh, one, one more down at the bottom, cow's milk, very few people who are allergic to cow's milk are allergic to beef <clears throat> or get an adverse reaction eating beef. One more um, version, very, so risk of cross reactivity to goat's milk is quite high if you're allergic to cow's milk. As I said, I know many people who buy cow's mil uh, goat's milk, but it's fine if, it, if they are comfortable with it, that's the deal. Mare's milk, again, that must be, again, unusual circumstances, how they figured that one out. Okay, so we already talked about birch pollen. And if you are sensitive to peach, you might also be sensitive to almonds and other stone fruits, as they're called, about 55% or so. And then melon, as you see at the bottom. Yeah, if you're, you, if you're bothered by cantaloupe, you're most likely going to be bothered by quite a few other things, including avocado. <clears throat> Latex, we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, kiwi, banana, avocado, and the the dust from the ficus tree and possibly figs. And the, the reverse is presented here that the fruits can also make you sensitive to latex gloves with a small percentage, but still a possibility. Okay. Um, oh, make, okay. <clears throat> so I have it off completely. How's that, Barbara? Uh, probably about the, uh, about the same. How's that now? That's better. Yeah, it's better. Now, I, I just want you to let me know if you hear my radio playing in the background. No? No. <laughs> All right. So, any questions from anybody about allergies and cross-reacting of allergies? Or which cell shells to save over the summer when you go to the beach? Any questions? Okay. <clears throat> so, there are other things that plants might be bothering you with, and it doesn't involve the immune system necessarily, but you want to know what to look out for and what to, um, what to replace it with. So there's this category called lectins. <clears throat> and as you see, there's a lot of different foods that contain lectins, and lectins are um, strange particles that are in foods. Um, they also can cause a histamine release when they bind to the cells that I mentioned earlier. They can attach to the cells on the surface of your different organs. And that could lead to that leaky gut or hyperpermeability where things can cross out of it into the bloodstream, which normally wouldn't have. And some lectins are airborne. Um, there's a story of, let's see where, it, I think it's in the next slide that a town had a bean processing plant and people in the town had a very high um, incidence of, see, incidence are new cases, prevalence is existing cases. So they got a lot of people being diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease because of the airborne lectins from this bean processing plant. Um, once again, could be reversed with omission or discontinuing exposure. Okay, so they bind the cells in the mouth, in the stomach, in the small and the large intestines, in the liver, in the duodenum, and they can give you adverse reactions of just, you know, feeling crappy. Um, they include tomato, even lettuce. So, we know, I don't know anyone that doesn't eat lettuce well or people who can't eat cucumber. And sometimes people say, I don't like that. And when you kind of say, what is it about it you don't like? Is I don't know, I just don't. It smells funny, it tastes funny, it feels funny. So there might be an intuitive thing going on where people just say, if I eat that, I'm not gonna be happy. So yeah, you can keep it, you can have my portion. Even vanilla, yogurt, coconut, banana, and others. And I say, wow, if that's you, bye-bye pina coladas, huh? So, <clears throat> Another sensitivity, these things are different kind of lectins and a famous lectin. Um, so some, they do different things, these lectins. In fact, a lectin is the, um, the basis of doing blood typing. 
I do not know the process, but it's it's the way if you want to know if you're O positive or negative, A or B. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but they can cause some fairly wicked things, like cause your red blood cells to clump together and solidify your blood. Doesn't that sound pretty scary? But in fact, there's a a product derived from the castor plant that can be purified into something called ricin and that is used as a, a weapon of terror because it can be a very very small amount described as the size of a grain of salt that can cause um, serious body harm and possibly death and there's a well-known story, I think it was from the 1960s, if someone put ricin on an umbrella tip. Okay, let's not get dark here, but um, even the TV series um, Breaking Bad had an episode in which ricin synthesis and purification was part of the story. Okay, there's these other glycolectins <clears throat> where I mentioned the Hodgkin's disease develop in the town that had a response from processing navy beans. Um, pokeweed was another one that I'm sure Barbara is aware of because we yank it out of our gardens and our lawns and our flower beds a lot. Um, so this can stimulate lymphocytes, which are part of the, the immune system when they enter circulation. I'm gonna move on to the next slide. And it's a little more detail about ricin, but I'm not gonna carry on. You can, you and I can go on a holiday and find, see these plants growing. First of all, they are sold in um, centers where you might buy a plant for your, your hotel lobby or your bank lobby. It's probably not the kind of tree you would put in your home, but it's a castor tree. And when it does bear the, its seed, it looks like this pod and then the seeds are looking like this when they come out. And rice and seeds are illegal to import because they, they are very dangerous. Okay, so those are the things we call lectins. Now, <clears throat> it's possible that, remember we said histamine is this very powerful chemical that happens when the immune system sees a potentially dangerous thing it attaches to it and then attaches to cell surfaces and histamine comes um, gushing out. You can get histamine from other things, not just your immune system. So it, it can be made by bacteria, it could be in cheese, it could be in sausages, it can be in something like a dried fish. And it has a peppery taste. So on a blue moon, you will have someone say these are not necessarily spoiled foods, although makes you ask a question, <laughs> but they could be just a sensitivity by the person that says this food doesn't taste right. And here is a cartoon, not a very friendly cartoon, but what are the things that happen when this um, histamine is ingested by someone from one of these bacteria produced in food? And it could be a tingling or a burning of the mouth. It could be a rash on upper body. It could be a headache. It could be itchy skin, nausea, vomiting. So you're not going, you could go to the emergency room if you, if you know anyone that thinks they might have had this histamine or this scombroid poisoning. Both of these can come about from bacteria breaking down things in food. Not the immune system, but still a very adverse reaction to food. And they can be treated with Benadryl and things like that. <clears throat> Generally not life-threatening, but probably good and miserable. I used to work at a company in their corporate wellness department and they had one of the best corporate cafeterias you're ever gonna get. And <clears throat> one Wednesday afternoon, about three people every 10 minutes after lunch would come in with the, the symptoms that are listed here and that was fish that had been served in the cafeteria. And I would vouch for that cafeteria, high quality, excellent trained chefs. So it wasn't something that you would say the fish sat in the refrigerator too long. So it must've been the wholesaler or just a fluke. But these things occur 
and they are adverse. So let's move on. Who has lactose intolerance? <clears throat> no fun at all. Um, and one of the things I like to qualify about lactose intolerance, and it is not what you need is this sugar lactose, which is called a disaccharide. It's two sugars bound together, glucose and galactose. And your intestines produce an enzyme called lactase, which breaks it apart. But if for some reason you don't have enough lactase being produced in your intestines, then the lactose finds its way into the large intestine where the normal bacteria that live there will welcome that lactose and treat it like it's New Year's Eve. They will party, party, and your, your belly will experience gas and acid, um, and you won't feel good. So most people either are aware that they have lactose intolerance and just only eat their milky foods when they're getting ready to go to bed, like a bowl of cereal or some ice cream, because you sort of know this might happen and at least I'll sleep through it. <clears throat> and in the old medical books, you would see someone describing lactose intolerance as being abnormal, but it's not. More people on the face of the earth have lack, low levels of lactase activity, that enzyme there. So it's actually normal to be lactose intolerant. And people used to make a case, well, the lactase activity, that enzyme that breaks down the, sh the lactose, the sh milk sugar, only occurs where people have come from long lines of, of people who had cows and, and goats. So I don't come from a long line of people who had cows and goats, and I'm, I don't have lactose intolerance. And there are people who have come from places in their multi-generations where everybody had herds of cattle and they do have lactose intolerance. So it isn't automatically what is your genetic or your cultural history, but it is normal to have lactose intolerance. And most people say it's the dose that makes the poison. So if I just put a little bit in my coffee or eat a small amount of ice cream, I'm okay. <clears throat> There isn't lactose, significant lactose in cheese. So here, here, you're good with your cheddar and your American cheese and your Swiss cheese. Rock it, that's the good stuff. Okay, what's another adverse reaction that isn't the immune system? Um, and this is another case, these little proteins called peptides, they bound to those mast cells and they shoot out that histamine. And those are in, we, I mentioned them before, but I'm sort of again giving the total list at once. Um, so if you're sensitive to those foods, that might be what's going on. And then the enzyme that is in fresh pineapple and also fresh, um, ah, not mango, um, <clears throat> papaya, is an enzyme which is called proteolytic. And I'm gonna break that one down. Lytic means splitting apart and proteo means protein. So there's an enzyme naturally found in pineapple and papaya that breaks down protein. In fact, you can see them on the jars of meat tenderizer and they're called bromelain and papin. So when you eat a raw pineapple and for some people raw papaya, in a little while, those enzymes are gonna start breaking down the protein on the surface of your tongue and you're gonna get a sore tongue. Most of the time, everyone knows it and you just intuitively say, I guess I'll switch over to some blueberries or strawberries now because my tongue is bothering me. And it's also important to know that <clears throat> the canned pineapple does not bother you because the heat has inactivated that enzyme. Another little thing that makes you know the enzyme is there. If anybody still does that old fashioned thing of taking a jello and adding fruit to the jello that really goes back does that take us back to you know to home economics class in ninth grade well you never want to put raw pineapple in your gelatin because gelatin is a protein 
and the raw pineapple has that enzyme that's going to break that protein apart. So you'll come back in seven hours, 12 hours, and your gelatin is going to look gloppy. It didn't set. But if you use canned pineapple, you're okay because the enzyme has been inactivated by the heating of the can. <clears throat> so then we used to talk about um, Chinese restaurant syndrome, that if you ate monosodium glutamate in large quantities like you might get in a meal from a Chinese restaurant, you would get headache and feel like you're having a heart attack. But that's been challenged. Anyway, think about it if you find some foods make you feel anxious or palpitations or something uncomfortable. What was in the meal? What were some of the other ingredients? Okay, I'm going to talk a little more about sulfite. And let me emphasize, this is not to make everybody crazy. A little bit, but not a lot. <clears throat> Sulfites are found naturally in a lot of foods, and they are also added to foods as a preservative. They add it to protect the changes in the color. So you'll see sulfites are in things like dried apples and dried um, papaya, dried mango, because those colors will turn brown and look gross if something is in there to, to arrest the color change. Um, <clears throat> It seems as though people who are sulfite sensitive mainly are people who already have asthma. And it isn't everybody with asthma, but some people. And here are some of the different ways that those sulfites could be in your food, but once again, they will be on a label. Sulfur dioxide, sulfur bisulfite, sul sodium meta bisulfite. Can, can you get these words out? <clears throat> It's the presence of the sulfur. Now, that's not the same as taking a sulfur drug. And if you're not sure, just check with your primary care provider. So these are where you're gonna get most of your sulfites in vinegar, wine, dried fruits, dried foods in general. Once again, it's protecting the change in the color as well as acting as a preservative. Um, you also get sulfite out of things besides food. It's in air pollution, it's in cleaning agents. So people, anyone sulfite sensitive needs to be aware of what products they're consuming. So that sounds like there's an enzyme that breaks the sulfite, alters the sulfite structure. And some people don't make a lot of that enzyme. So when they eat it, they get these um, adverse feelings of um, itchy and sort of anxiety. Um, there's not as much of the enzyme in the lungs as there might be in the intestines. So be aware if someone has a sensitivity to sulfite, where to look for it. Here's some examples of where you'll get it. So you're probably thinking, it's everywhere. And yeah, it is. <laughs> um, <clears throat> once again, however, it will be on a label. So someone who is sensitive can find it and avoid it. And there are lots of websites with suggestions on substitutions for sulfite or, or sulfite-free foods. Um, in fact, if you like dried fruit, there are sulfite-free dried fruits that are brown and chewy. They're delicious, they just aren't pretty. Okay, so you get it in puddings and fillings and gelatin, cornstarch, gravies, noodle mixes, <coughs> dried or canned soups, syrups, yeah, it's pretty much, these are mostly processed foods. These are foods that have to be on the shelf for a while. And this is helping to keep the food from deteriorating or looking like it has deteriorated. Okay, symptoms and signs, throat irritation, coughing. No, it's, I'm not a sulfite sensitive cougher. I don't know what I am. Okay, degree of sensitivity to sulfites um, <clears throat> may depend on what foods you're eating may improve right away within 30 minutes. So again, it's not life-threatening, not necessary to have an emergency room visit. Um, <coughs> <coughs> but for some, it may last longer, excuse me. Um, so I'm going to say these are the foods that will have a sulfite. The label will give you the presence of sulfite. And there are things that you can replace most of those highly allergenic foods, which we said wheat and gluten, 
which could also be in rye and barley, gluten-free or rice-based foods. <coughs> you can replace nuts with melon seeds, like um, the seeds of pumpkin, seeds of cantaloupe. They look funny, but they can toast up and be very tasty. You can replace eggs with tofu. Um, <clears throat> corn and other grains can be replaced with different varieties of rice, jasmine rice, um, black rice, wild rice, potatoes, buckwheat, quinoa, yams can all replace those other wheat and corn that someone might be sensitive to. You can replace peanuts with roasted chickpeas. Um, that was not one of the ones that peanut has a cross reactivity with. You can refra replace fish with poultry. <clears throat> and I didn't make a substitute for soy, so I'm going to pretend it's not there. Moving right along. Okay, one of the things that the many different foods that we're saying these might have lectins or they might cause a histamine response, you definitely want to get good sources of fiber in your diet. So taking out fruits and vegetables is not going to be the best thing. So Remember asparagus and spinach, broccoli, cabbage, cucumbers. Yes, cucumbers were a sensitive food for some people, but it's a very small number. <clears throat> if bananas and kiwi and strawberries are not your friend, go back to grapes and cherries, plums and pears. These are all good. <clears throat> and the whole grain can be replaced with millet, quinoa and buckwheat. All right, the last two, three slides <clears throat> are Elimination diet. So I will say, in the medical field, the elimination diet is kind of, half of the people say it's a good idea, the other half say it's a lot of work and you have to be you know, really conscientious or you may not get this, the outcome you want. But let's say you take seven days and these are the only foods you eat for, across those seven days. So there's no sulfites. There's no gluten, um, there's no crustaceans or mollusks, okay? So rice, chicken, apricots, pineapple, could be canned. Um, beets, sweet potato, cranberries, lettuce, peaches. I did not create this list. I've taken it from several sources. Uh, and I, I trust that these have been sort of field tested, but if these are foods which one eats only these for seven days and then reintroduces foods that are thought to be problematic gradually, it may make it easy to identify what you should try to replace or minimize or eliminate. Um, keep in mind when we do have our um, sensitivity to things that we want to still have a little uh, almost a bit beyond a quarter of our plate contain vegetables, a little shy of a quarter of our plate of our whole day having fruits, whole grains, and I mentioned some whole grains in the substitution list, and healthy proteins such as if you're not allergic to fish or beef or pork or lamb or chicken. If you are plant-based, then this can be tofu, this can be cheese, uh, remember, cheese does not have lactose, or the amount of lactose is so very, 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 almost immeasurably low that it should not cause symptoms. And finally, any questions or comments? This was such an excellent presentation. You mentioned that cheese does not have la lactose. How about yogurt? Yogurt does. But yogurt has the microorganisms, which seem to be in, in in experience has broken down some of the lactose in the yogurt so that it's better tolerated. So that might be the one where we say it's the dose that makes the, the poison. If you have a small amount of yogurt and see how it feels. Fortunately, it's also not life threatening, but it can be pretty annoying. You always do such an excellent job. Thank you. I don't know who's speaking. I'm going to roll my images around. It's Amy. I'm calling in from Kansas. Thank you, Amy. Thank you very much. Anybody, if you prefer, you can put the uh, question in the chat. Um, let's see. Uh, 
I think we're, I, it looks like you answered everybody. You were very thorough. Okay. <laughs> and I put on the better earrings too. <laughs> oh, good. And it, and it worked. <laughs> it worked. Okay. Thank you well, all very much for your attention. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And thank uh, you too. Very excellent presentation as always. Thank you. All You're right. So we will see you all soon. Couldn't have been any okay. better or any more thorough. We appreciate you so much. Okay. I'm honored to be here for you. <laughs>